Hey everybody, what's up and welcome back. If you're new here, I'm Liz, your host here at Crimes Untold. And today we're going to be talking about a lovely series of murders that may or may not have been committed by the person that was arrested and convicted in connection to one of them. So today we're going to be talking about the Ypsilanti Ripper. Hopefully I said that right. Or uh, what he's also called is the Michigan uh, Ripper. Or it's a series of murders that happened in Ann Arbor or Ypsilanti or southeastern Michigan between 1967 and 1968, in the late 60s in Michigan. And our perpetrator was caught in 1969. He terrorized this area for that span of time. So, are y'all excited to talk about this person? Because I'm not, because he's uh, crazy. He also was called the co-ed killer, not to be confused with Ed Kemper, because Ed Kemper also was called the co-ed killer as well. Um, and if I seem a little hyper, it's because this is uh, my second cup of caffeinated coffee today. Um, yeah, if you're new here, I just switched shifts, so this, I, I've been in a kind of like weird, um, weird schedule, if you will, and last week technology hated me, so I didn't really upload, I uploaded once, that was about it, but anywho, anywho, so let's, let's get back into this. So to be more specific, these women, they were all beaten, raped, post-abduction, they were also all stabbed or strangled to death. The other curveball to this on the rarity is that some of the victims were mutilated prior to them being discarded. Yes. Now all the bodies were discarded within a 15 mile radius of the county of Washtenaw. Hopefully I said that right as well. So let's just jump straight into our victims. There are seven I'm going to be talking about. One of them is like an added in. One he was convicted of, which I'll talk about later. It all depends on how long this ends up being. But So our first one is Mary Therese Flazar. She was a 19-year-old student at Eastern Michigan University. She was last seen walking back to her apartment in Ypsilanti on July 9th of 1967. So her neighbor last saw her with a young male that they were having a conversation with her, like, together, or he had tried to. And I say this because the neighbor said that they had two different interactions. They saw him talking to her. Now he's in his car and she's driving, uh, he's driving along and she's walking. She, he stopped, said something to her. She shook her head and started walking again. So he did it again, like drove up next to her, stopped, said something. And then she shook her head and began walking away again. The vehicle he was in is a Chevrolet, which will kind of talk about vehicles after too as well. Mary would be found on abandoned farmland on August 7th of 1967 in Superior Township. She was found by two 15 year old boys, which this also is another thing that we see is a correlation of who finds them and where they're being found. So keep that all up in your noggin. Uh, so her body was severely decomposed and nude. She had been stabbed approximately 30 times with a sharp object or a knife in the abdomen and also in the chest. Another simulation, uh, similarity, simulation, another similarity with another victim that we have is the fact of where she was stabbed and this other victim as well. Um, also, there was dismemberment with this one, which is not something that's similar to the other ones. Um, her feet were severed above the ankle. Sections of her fingers and a thumb on a hand and a forearm were missing and never recovered. During her autopsy, it was determined that she had lineal abrasions on her torso or chest area, which indicated that she had been beaten prior to her demise. It also was concluded that she was sexually assaulted due to this and she was sexually assaulted, but due to the state of her corpse, they didn't or they couldn't specify when it happened. They couldn't figure out whether it was pre-mortem, anti-mortem, or post-mortem. They couldn't figure out. I was just going to say pre-mortem, but it's anti-mortem. They couldn't, they couldn't formulate that decision of when exactly she was sexually assaulted. So that was kind of something that they were like, mm, she's sexually assaulted, we just don't know when. Uh, they also couldn't figure out when, like, or what, or they couldn't figure out if they could find any evidence on her body to help substantiate the rape or help identify who did this to her. She remained a Jane Doe until the next day when she was identified via dental records on August 8th. So the scene in which 
they found her body, revealed that her body was actually moved a few times. And she was moved a few times in the month prior to her being found. So she had died in July and not in August. Um, like, somebody wanted her to be found with them moving her a bunch of times. So her body was dragged a few feet from initially where it's thought she was. And this was by an elder tree. She then was dragged into a field in which exposed her body to the element, which helped speed up decomposition. If you don't know about decomp decomposition, it depends on your, like the elements around you, the uh, weather around you, it speeds up or it will help hinder your decomposition rate. Um, so just before they discovered her body, she was moved three feet, uh, to initiate the process of somebody seeing her remains. So she was finally within a bird's eye view. Maybe he got a thrill out of doing this or wanting her to be found, which can happen. Um, so apparently following her identification and funeral, there was a person that asked to take a photo of her body as a keepsake for the family, well, for specifically for the parents. And it's the receptionist that this person is talking to. So when the receptionist for the funeral home told him no, this young man said, then can you just you can't just fix her up enough so I can just get one photo. Uh, he then was informed no for a second time and that he couldn't just see the body because he's not family. And then he abruptly left the funeral home. Uh, this person, the receptionist, said that he was quite handsome. He was a handsome young man that uh, had darker hair and he drove a bluish gray Chevrolet-ish type car. but wasn't carrying a camera on him. So this was a little strange that he wanted to take a picture. Who was this young man? Who was this the killer? This brings us to our next victim. So Joan Elspeth Schell, uh, she was found on July 5th of 1968. She was found dead. She was a 20-year-old art student, and it's unfortunate that she died. So there was construction workers that found her on the side of a road in Ann Arbor. She was in an interesting state of decay, we'll say this. So the upper third half of her body was in an advanced state of decomposition, whereas the rest of her body, the lower third of her, was very well preserved, like she was in a cool area. So her body was kind of in like a strange state, if you will. Um, kind of in like a, like her body was stuck in a refrigerated place, which is kind of odd. Also, apologies, I gotta move you a little bit. So the miniskirt she was found, well, that she was known to be wearing when she disappeared was found tied around her neck, like it was used to strangle her, or like a garrote, which is ironic because her throat was actually slashed. So this, she could have been strangled prior to her throat being slashed, um, kind of like an overkill moment. Um, so she also suffered from stab wounds, 25 to be exact, that were caused by a knife that was able to be determined to be about four inches in length. So something small that he could keep on him. Uh, her carotid artery, her liver, and her lungs were punctured via the stab wounds. She also had a small wound behind her ear, um, her left ear, in which caused a skull fracture. And it was determined that she was dead for a few days prior to her being found. The scene also had led them to believe that she died in a different location and her body was then disposed of in this area due to no blood evidence being found underneath her body. There was no denying that her case had similarities to that of our first victim, so investigators worked hard to try and connect these cases together. Uh, and they tried to do that with a bigger group of detectives that solely were working on these cases to try and link them. Well, well. Um, So, of course, the first thing they should do is try and determine why and when this happened. So, the last time she was seen alive was from her roommate, Susan Kolb. This was on June 30th at a bus stop on Wa Washington, Washington, yeah, Washington Avenue. Susan had told her roommate that, so she asked her roommate to accompany her to the bus stop prior to Joan going to Ann Arbor to visit her boyfriend. That way, uh, she would safely get on the bus to go to Ann Arbor to visit her boyfriend. So apparently Joan told Susan that she was going to hitchhike because she missed the bus. And this is when a Pontiac Bonneville that looked similar to a Chevy sedan uh, that was of a silverish color uh, pulled up and offered a ride. She was quick to say yes. 
Susan tried to dissuade her from going into the car that was filled with three young men, but Joan assured her that she would contact her when she arrived at her boyfriend's house. But lo and behold, Joan never called Susan, and Susan reported her missing after never hearing from her. Susan also told the police with the encounter with the Bonneville and that it was red and black painted or that there was red and black painting on it, but there was also silver painting on it as well. All of the leads following her murder uh, and her discovery were exhausted. There would be a reward for information about this murder that equaled about $7,800 uh, if it led to any convictions for the murders, but nothing proved fruitful. That was until two eyewitnesses said that they saw Joan talking to a man on Emmett Street the same day that she went missing. These witnesses said that there was a person, uh, that the person she was talking to was from Eastern Michigan University, and that this was a student named John Norman Collins. He lived across the street from Joan. Yeah, I want you to remember this name. He was questioned by police about his whereabouts, and he said the weekend of, her, of the murder of Joan, he was visiting his mother, and that he wasn't in the vicinity at the time of the murders. The police didn't verify what he said and just took him at his word. Jane Louise Mixter was a 23-year-old Michigan University student that went missing on March 20th of 1969. She was at a uh, college bulletin board when she posted a note looking for a ride to go back home to Muskegon. And the reason for this is because she wanted to inform her family that she had gotten engaged and she was moving to New York relatively quickly. Unfortunately, she would never be able to inform them because her body was found in Denton at the Denton ceremony is uh, at the Denton cemetery on top of a grave. Her trench coat was covering her body uh, with a copy of the book Catch Twenty Two just lying at her side. When the trench coat when the trench coat raincoat was removed, uh, her tights were found lowered, which indicated that there was a possible sexual assault on her body. Um, or that it was the motivation for the murder. But this was proved to be false. She was not sexually assaulted. She was wearing a pad. So for me, um, I believe that this stopped him from trying to assault her, hence why her murder was so vicious. I will go back to that in a little bit. Um, so she was shot twice in the head with a 22 caliber pistol, and then she was strangled with the tights, uh, with tights that were not hers. These tights were brought by the perpetrator, and the tights were made into a garrote, which is tightly around the neck and pulled from behind. Yeah, it can be pulled from in front as well, but typically it's from behind. So I believe that he put the garrote around her neck when he was trying to assault her, and he realized, shit, well, I can't sexually assault her um, due to her having her period, um, and he wouldn't be able to fulfill the sexual nature of the crime. So then he shot her. Her death was determined to have happened at around 3 a.m. on March 21st of 1969, and she wasn't killed at the cemetery in Van Buren Township. I will say there's some inconsistencies when they tried to tie her murder to that of the other murders due to her not being assaulted. She wasn't mutilated, she wasn't stabbed or beaten whatsoever, and I will revisit that as well at the end of this video. 16-year-old Marilyn Skelton was found on Earhart Road behind a vacant house on March 25th. This was four days after the discovery of Jane Mixer. This teenage girl was found near where Joan Shell was found uh, just eight months prior, so very close proximity. This teenage girl was savagely beaten to the point of pure torture. The injuries that were inflicted on her body were some of the worst ones that one of the responding officers said he'd ever seen in the 30 years he was on the police force. Her autopsy showed that she suffered from multiple fractures on the one-third of her skull, including the side of her face. This was caused by a blunt, like blunt force trauma due to a blunt object, and this was her cause of death. While receiving the beating on her body, um, he shoved part of her shirt down her throat, specifically into her trachea, so she could not scream, so nobody could hear her. At some point, the killer also took her garter belt, or a garter belt, tied it around her neck, and strangled her. She also appeared to have welt marks on her shoulders and her chest, and the coroner believed that this was from being restrained as she was being whipped with a leather belt or a strap. 
The strap or belt also caused some deep lacerations, but beating her wasn't enough. He then took a branch from a tree and forcefully sodomized her vaginally. This branch was found inserted approximately eight inches in her vaginal canal. I know, gruesome, but this plays into my theory. At the scene as well, they found disturbances in the fauna that showed she would more than likely had tried to escape him, but was unable to get away. And they also found blood spatter near where her body was found, which indicated she was killed close to where her body was. Um, her clothes were neatly folded and her shoes were found next to her. Marilyn Skelton went missing on March 27th and she was found on the 29th. She was last seen on Washtenaw Ave on the 27th. She was outside of a drive-in restaurant. This too is a little funky because the coroner said that she could have died approximately 24 to 36 hours prior to being found, but also her decomposition rate also plays a fact into that. And so does the weather outside because she was found outside. There is no denying on how close these similarities are, especially with her death in the initial two, but due to how savage her death is, they were quick to not connect her case to the others. Also, she was an informant for the police due to drug-related crimes she had. She had prior drug use, and she was a uh, also involved in drug sales. Um, so she was an informant for the police. And ultimately, her case would end up being connected to the others, which is a good thing because it was the police chief for Ann Arbor that did so. So I believe that her murder was so vicious because he wasn't able to fulfill his sexual, de sexually derived wishes for the murders of Jane Mixer. So because Jane Mixer wasn't assaulted, he pulled down her tights and was wearing a pad. Um, it would hinder him from committing the assault. But this is a rare occurrence. Um, probably it angered him to the point where he felt like he wasn't fully fulfilled of his drive, so he needed to fulfill his thrill kill. He needed to resolve this feeling sooner rather than later, but he likely would find out, uh, we would find out this isn't the case due to all of them being on their period at the time of their death. So that clearly did not stop him. Something must have spooked him. Yeah. Also his MO or modus operandi was not out like more clearly following the murder of Marilyn Skelton in the last two murders or actually the last four like the last three murders if you will. All the victims were brunettes. All were killed or found within 15 miles of Washtenaw County. All had something tied around their neck like a strangulation or garrote tool. All except for Jane Mixer, the oddball. They were stabbed in the neck with something. All had been on their period at the same time of their death. The police also were able to deduce that at least three of the four murders, the first four murders, were related. And to me, this just makes them, or seems that, Jane Mixer's murder is solo. And they need to keep it separate from the other serial killings. But this would not stop our perpetrator. 